Lately, it seems like a lot of composers and producers have a ton of anxiety over how technology and AI might one day make us all obsolete. I mean, why would a company pay for music from a human if they could just get something computer-generated which is just as good? Right? Well, to help us understand why we might get so wound up about the threat of technology, I thought it would be a good idea to get an historical perspective. And to do that, I'll need some help from someone with multiple degrees in the subject of music history, Mrs. 52 Qs herself, Shannon Croft, who's going to take us on a multiple centuries long journey to show us that this technological apprehension really is nothing new. And we're gonna talk about how we can today best leverage new tools to our own benefit. Plus, we take a listen to a guitar-driven muddy blues cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week we're going to be listening to Miss My Mama Blues, which is a guitar-driven muddy blues cue written by Doug Knight for a taxi listing so you definitely, definitely want to stick around for that. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad you found me, however you found me. I mean, I know you have a ton of options out there, so appreciate, I appreciate you spending part of your day with me. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything we do here going. We are 100% community supported, so if you like what I do, don't thank me thank them. But if you want to learn more about how you can support 52 Qs and unlock extra perks like live streams, workshops, interactive feedback, and a lot more, then uh, click the links in, in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking much more about that a little bit later. AI, technology, why do we fear these things? Why are we afraid of all these new things? Are, are the robot overlords coming to take our jobs. Well, with someone, you know, myself, with an undergraduate in music history, I firmly believe that by looking back, by looking back on where we've been, we can get a really clear picture on where we're going. And in order to help me tell that story and to discuss how technology has always, always given working composers anxiety I had to bring in the bigger guns. This is my uh, my chat on technology and AI with Shannon Croft. I am so happy to welcome back to the podcast, Mrs. 52 Qs, my absolute better half. It is Shannon Croft. Shannon, hello. Hello, Dave. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are things downstairs? <laughs> downstairs is good, man, though it's hot out. I know. Um, actually, in Orlando, we're better off than a lot of people in the States right now. And even oh, in Europe. I know. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Europe's getting crushed, man. Yeah. So here we are talking about the weather. Wow. Yes, how lame exactly. am I? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's what it is. But, uh, you know, today's topic, talking about AI and are there robots coming to take our jobs? And one of the reasons I, I wanted to have you on the podcast, and it actually started out as a discussion, as as we are oft to do, mm -hmm. just hanging out, maybe driving around, going and getting a coffee or something, and just talking about the industry, talking about music in general. And, you know, we got on the subject of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, right. and how much anxiety it seems to uh, to rile up in people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to have you on specifically to talk about it, not just because you know you're super smart and you're my favorite person, but also because with someone with a master's in musicology, meaning music history and an undergraduate in music history, you you can bring a lot of historical perspective because, the uh, the anxiety about technology replacing humans <laughs> is nothing new, is it? 
It's really not. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about my first encounter with the idea of music AI. Hmm. I'm just hanging out here in my office, sitting at my desk, chilling. I see this little uh, probably YouTube ad popped up. And it was like, never have to contact a composer again. I was like, what? <laughs> Clicked on it. And of course, it's AI and their whole shtick, you know, their whole marketing thing was when you need music, you don't have to go to, you know, a music composer and deal with all their crap. You can just, you know, put in the genre and we'll spit out your music. And I will admit for a second, I was like, oh, my God, the robots are coming to take our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and, and that's when we got to talking about it. Um, but yeah, the, the, um, I'm happy to say I don't feel like that anymore. That's just kind of the gut reaction. I mean, anytime you see something you care about, it's like humans are replaced with robots. Oh, God. But yeah, um, yeah well, it's, it's because, I mean, it does a passable job. Like there's, there's AI doing art right now. Like you can just put in a bunch of random keywords and it will generate. Mm -hmm. Some uh, really cool stuff. Some very realistic looking, like, it looks like album art, really. And uh, and that's, on one hand, really exciting. But on the other hand, you know, it's replacing humans. And, and I feel like, I feel like us composers, especially in the production music world, where we, I, I've said here, what we're doing isn't art, right? Our music lives in the background. And it is, for lack of a better word, I, I don't even know if I want to say this. Oh dear! It's not. It's not disposable, but it's certainly and it's important. But it's certainly way in the background. You right. know, it's it's right. the, the 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 set dressing. It's a supporting player. That's absolutely right. And it's, so it's when, got to when, be there, but it's not what the story's about. Yeah, and so when when productions may look to start cutting corners, I feel like our corner feels on the chopping block. But like I, like I mentioned. This isn't anything new. This isn't right. a new to the industry. Composers have for a long time wrestled with how technology and art intersects with commerce, you know? Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about that. First, I want to say that um, when when I was started thinking about this topic, I put a, a poll up on our 52Qs community and I simply asked, um, what's your take on AI generated music? And... Uh, uh, probably a little over half were either cool, another tool for my toolbox, or cautiously optimistic. I'm hoping I can leverage it somehow. Then we had about 25% that said not concerned. You can never take the human soul out of music. And just a couple of people who were like worried. Now anybody can make music. There's too much competition. Um, and a couple people said, I hate it. It's another degradation of art and the <laughs> professionals who make it. <laughs> so pretty wide spectrum. Pretty wide spectrum, but most, you know, at least half landing on the upside of like, hey, this is cool. So I just wanted to, uh, music historians have the, the, the superpower of hindsight. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to talk a little bit specifically about the first jazz recording. Because recording, of course, was a brand new technology. And but I'm I gotta start farther back than that, I think. Um I need to start in around the year nine hundred. Nine hundred. Nine hundred. Not nineteen hundred. Okay. Okay. Nine hundred. That that's, that's going way back for sure. It is going way back. <laughs> and I won't spend long there because I mean how relevant can it really be? But um this was back in the day. Um, when Constantine had just kind of um, come to power and there was the Catholic Church. Now, why am I talking about church music? Because music was done in the church. You know, there was secular music and lutes and stuff. And, and then the, the music that mattered was in the church. And um, they decided that they can't have just everybody singing everything willy nilly on a Sunday morning or Saturday night mass or whatever it was. And so the, the, um, Pope Gregory, from whom we get the term Gregorian, Gregorian chant, chant. Yeah. Um, actually set down, even though we didn't have proper music notation yet, set down sort of reminders of what these chants were supposed to sound like, and then pushed that out to, 
you know, um, the kingdom or the so realm. This, this is this is the the uh, the the nine nine hundred version nine hundred A D version of live streaming. It, it's it's trying to get all yeah. of the churches, all of all of the uh, spread across the world, mm-hmm. uh, or at least you know Europe, uh, which was quote unquote <laughs> the world in their right. eyes. Trying to get them all literally on the same page, doing the same thing every day, so right. that I guess you know God will go, hey, it's all together. So you know, yeah. Ooh. Woo. Thank goodness. Because <laughs> that's what matters. Um, but, you know, it's it, okay, cool. I mean, I, I'm sure, it, not I'm sure, it was a grandiose idea, you know, at that time. Mm-hmm. Because the idea of um, mass circulation and mass production and, and uh, that just wasn't a thing. You know, you most people didn't ever go more than five miles from their home. So, um, then we got music notation that developed out of all of that and, and cool. So, um, I can imagine that, you know, um, country squire, you know, got the, uh, the edict to sing this exactly. And what about, yeah, I don't know. Now I'm just (laughs) guessing. I mean, it was 1200 years ago, so cool. (laughs) 10th Uh, century. (laughs) And then, uh, as we progress through the centuries, every time there's a new, music technology, the reaction is fear. Hmm. And so I think we have to, you know, just stick a pin in this, but we have to take a look at fear as a creative. How do we deal with it? How do we get a handle on it when there's, I mean, AI music seems like a legit thing to be worried about, but how do you deal with like, okay, this is going sideways. I'm not sure about this. But anyway, as we progressed through uh, the ages, you know, uh, things develop. Suddenly we have the uh, the organ coming in. Oh, my God, we'll never be able to hear the voices. It's going to replace any instrument. It's going to. And everybody was freaking out about using the organ. Replacing musicians. So instead of, you know, you know, right. Bach had like house musicians, he had a house right. orchestra. But right. now it's just an organ. And yeah. to the and. Arguably, they have something to worry about because they're. If you look at you know, uh, especially modern organs, it's like trumpets and woodwinds, right. and, and it's it's set out in. Yeah, it's got all these in, all those stoppers that you mm-hmm. see. Um, it's things that you can pull out and push in that makes the sound different as it travels through the pipes. So it imitates woodwinds. It imitates you know uh, trumpets or strings or whatever. So so Baroque so, era musicians were sweating the organ. Yeah. Because there goes my gig. Mm -hmm. And I guess the the closest thing that I can, the closest analogy I have for that in the modern day is um, tracks being used in in live theater. Musicals, yeah. And yeah, we have seen some, you know, especially local, you know, smaller local um, theater houses using tracks instead of bringing in an orchestra. But I would say the vast majority have opted not to use the tracks. They would rather use three or four humans than a track that sounds like 60 people. And I think that's such a key point for this, which is you can't take the human out of the equation. You just no, can't. Not, not for long and not, not for with long. sustained success. Right. Let, let's let's back up just a little bit because I, okay. I want to talk printing press. Oh Surely yeah. Surely the the printing press had 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 uh, had an Im- impact on composers and their ability to mass produce, but also do you think that you know music copyists started sweating it? Oh, sure. Well, they were either sweating it or rejoicing. I mean, you Mm. know, that that old trope of the monk sitting in the candlelit room all hunched over and he's been writing this for 67 years. You know, there is something to that. Um, It certainly was a convenience, but it was revolutionary in the way that the Internet has been revolutionary in our time. Mm. And and parenthetically, didn't the church kind of fight against... Not that we're beating up on the church, but didn't they fight against the printing press? Because now suddenly, like, knowledge is in the hand of the masses. Because before then, the church was a seat of the arts, seat of education. Yep. Only learned people were in, in ministry. Right. And that had started to shift earlier with the rise of the university, Notre, mm. Dame, Notre Dame, and, right. you know, that idea that there could be, and of course, Notre Dame's a church, but um, the idea that there could be learning outside of a sacred environment was like gotcha. 
Oh right. my God. I keep hitting my mic. I'm so sorry about that. No, so good. sorry, you're podcast fine. listeners. It's a radio, baby. I man, I talk with my hands, can't help it. It's all good. <laughs> so um so yes, um, and I, I you know, the the Protestant Reformation was had everything to do with the excesses of the Catholic Church at that time. And 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 the thing you have to realize is even after the printing press, the Bible's in Latin. <laughs> and, I, you know, Peasant Joe doesn't yep. read Latin. And nope. so people only had the information that the clergy gave to them. And, and, yeah, and, and, and so what? That, yeah, that's sorry, just, go sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I, just, I just want to underscore why, we're, why we keep talking about yes. the church. Because, we're going somewhere with this. <laughs> right. It wasn't until, what would you say, 1600s, 1700s or so, when the church and art mm-hmm. started started splitting splitting apart. I mean, right. Bach was a church musician. Yes. yes he was high, Handel was a church musician. It wasn't mm-hmm. really until the classical era where we started to really see um, that type of music be wholly embraced in the secular environment. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah, before you know, then it was madrigals and things like that. And then we, well, I was just going to say we get into a discussion of um, popular music versus folk music. Mm-hmm. And I know we think popular is like Britney Spears and folk is John Denver or whatever. Yes, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but it it's really has to do with how the music is distributed and used. And so uh, up until the point where we started to get the technologies that could disseminate all of this musical information... Um, we were in the realm of folk music, which means it's music that is uh, mostly, you know, orally transmitted. It tells the stories of the people, all these English ballads like, uh, you know, <laughs> in the, in uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yep. When Brave Sir Robin. Brave Sir Robin. <laughs> no, that was a real thing. You know, yep. I mean, not that song, but the idea of, hey, I'm going to follow along with the king and write about all his exploits. And have a troubadour and, and sing magicals about your exploits. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So um, we may be getting into the weeds on this one there, Dave. No, but- I think it's fast. No, that's okay, uh, you- great. Hey, great. hey, I, I asked a music historian to come onto the, <laughs> onto the show, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't uh, don't don't bring the clowns and not expect a circus. That's so right. I'm totally That's fine. right. And I wasn't um, calling you a clown, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> I'm over it. Um, let's so you're yeah, talking about where... printing press and talking oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. about uh, the well, organ. The, the 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 whole thing. Just to finish up the thought about the printing press um, is that it made knowledge accessible to the layperson. Mm. Milkmaid Sarah and Shepherd Joe and all the guys hanging out at the village in the pub, everybody had access to information that they hadn't had previously. So one of the things we started to see the way that affected music is not necessarily like, oh, let's immediately print music because there was a, a in early music printing, every note had to be hand placed like like letters you know, and, and so to, to publish a piece of music was a lot of work. But what we did find was the broadsides where you'll see, and, and these these English ballads especially are verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. They're like 20, 30 <laughs> refrains long. And so what we would see is these broadsides are like a sheet of paper, you know, like newspaper with the lyrics printed on them. And then you would see, you know, sung to the tune of... Mm. Uh, Yankee Doodle, obviously not. That's that's not the thing. But um, and we see that even in hymnals, you know, into the 20th century, you'll see something set, and then it said can also be to the tune of, you know, this other thing. So yeah. does does that sound familiar? The idea of technology democratizing and mm-hmm. putting tools which were otherwise limited to an, an elite class of individuals, and now those tools have made Many more people have access to those. Just stick a pin in that. Just let that rattle around in your brain because nothing, nothing is new. That that sentiment. There's nothing new I am under the hearing sun. Every yeah, 
the latest version of uh, FL Studio comes out and suddenly, oh, it's not music. Oh, they're doing it. It's making it too easy. Anyway, a little TLDR fast forward, but <laughs> backing up, backing up. And yes. I hope, uh, listeners, I hope you're enjoying this. I, I could, we, <laughs> well, this is me, literally what we talk about. We talk about this <laughs> I know, stuff this is in like our downtime. Breakfast with Dave and Shannon. <laughs> I know. It feels like school. It feels like music history class at college for the, the rest of you, but this is. This is why this is we're, we've been married almost 30 years. Actually fun for us. Yeah, I know. We're weird. <laughs> so let's fast forward a couple hundred years. The idea is every time a, a new technology comes out, it it evokes fear. And because we, we fear what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so let's fast forward to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, at the end of the... At the end of the 19th century, we had Edison doing wax cylinder recordings. And um, I need to talk about the piano roll, but let me forget that. Okay. It's a very cool story. Anyway, they're doing these wax. It basically looks like a candle, a big fat candle on its side. And the recording quality was not fantastic. But I think that we we lose sight of the fact that if you ever wanted to hear music in your home, you had to play physically play it on an instrument. Ukulele was super, super, mm -hmm. super um, popular. And, um, you know, so I got a little text alert. It totally took me off my game, <laughs> no, man. It's, no, ukulele, the reason it was so, I mean, some of the early printed music in Tin Pan Alley and stuff or ukulele arrangements oh, yeah. because Absolutely. it was a relatively cheap instrument and only had it's four strings, easy to maintain, easy to, easy to, easy to play. Learn, you know? Yeah. And so if you wanted to sing, you know, Camp Town Races, you right. couldn't just like dial it up on Spotify. You had to play it with yourself and your right. hands and sing along or go see a concert. Right. Exactly. So, so live exactly. performances were the only way that you could experience music uh, and then the wax cylinder. But you mentioned piano roll. so I, I, I did. Uh, let me pause on piano roll for a second because it was a new technology. And for those who have never connected this, I mean, I was like, it was only like six or seven years ago that it connected in my head. The piano roll in the digital audio workstation is named for the piano roll on player pianos. And what it was, is had a scroll, a, a, a machine, a, an engine inside, and it would scroll a piece of music and someone would play into play the music and it would literally punch out holes for where the notes were. And then you would play it back through and it would reproduce mm -hmm. that performance. And so, interestingly enough, the only recording we have of Scott Joplin, who, of course, is the Maple Leaf Rag and all the mm -hmm. ragtime guy, um, is a piano roll. And it was actually made a little bit later in his life. He had a STD, which started to affect his hand-eye mm -hmm. coordination and stuff. And the performance is uneven. And it's mm -hmm. interesting to go back and listen to that because... You can tell that he's had a change in his cognitive abilities. Anyway, piano. No, I, no, I, no, cool. I think it's fascinating. If you wanted to hear, you know, uh, Stephen Foster's latest ditty on piano roll, then you would have to like load out whatever it was in and then load in. And they came in. They remind me of like the Hogwarts boxes that wands come in. Mm -hmm. They were these like kind of just boxes. Yeah. And, um, you would take out the scroll and you would unhook the other scroll and roll it back up, put it in its box, take out the scroll, put it in, wind it up, get it going. You know, so very, very um, for us, very labor intensive. But the idea of having s music in your home was was so great that yeah. this became a, a, a popular thing. And I can imagine that like like bar pianists probably were scared of the piano roll. I would they imagine probably so. thought, oh, my gosh, the piano there roll is coming job. to take my job. That's right. Well, speaking of recordings, let's fast forward a little bit. So there we are, end of the 19th century. We have the wax cylinders. And like I said, the quality is not good. It is literally the vibrations from the big old trumpet listening thing onto the wax. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of things were happening. The fidelity was not great. And these are literally wax cylinders like candles so we don't mm. have a whole lot of them um existing today because you know 
grandma and great grandma sticks them up in the attic and they all melt and they, you know, they, they're very fragile, very easy to damage. But it was our first actual recording medium. Well, pedal on through, you know, we're into World War One. We're starting to see some radio. We have um, coming up into World War One. we start to develop better recording technologies. We start to see the, the vinyl that we're so mm-hmm. used to. And um, it just so happens there's a brand new American, solely American art form developing in front of our eyes, and that's New Orleans jazz. And so uh, Victor goes, we've really got to record this. This is really interesting. Well, jazz grew up in New Orleans because it was a a port city. There's all these different cultures and um, things going on. And before the the Civil War, they even had uh, this place called Congo Square where all the slaves could go on a Sunday afternoon and hang out and play their stuff, Mm -hmm. which is incredibly unusual. Right. Incredibly unusual. Yeah. Unusual. Yeah. Most, and, and, yeah, most and people happened. took great pains to not let those people congregate. It just crazy. Right. Anyway, right. And that, yeah, and that's that's born in in the idea that uh, Louisiana was a Catholic colony mm-hmm. versus a Protestant comp- colony, and so uh, yeah, you can have Africans, you know, um, mm-hmm. practicing being African. And yeah, so that and was extremely, okay. like you said, extremely rare. And then jazz was born because we had African rhythms smashing up against Western European harmonies and marching music, you know, right. and uh, jazz. Because we're coming is, off the marching band like mm-hmm. John Philip Sousa, you know, mpa, 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 which becomes the basis for the left hand and the, mm-hmm. and the stride piano and... I'm just going to teach a course on this. Yep. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> But one of the things that actually contributed to that was, so we had all this mix of musical um, goodness going on. And right after the Spanish-American War, we suddenly had this influx of used instruments that were cheap. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're well after the Civil War now. Everybody's emancipated. um, And we have these super cheap instruments coming in and people were getting a hold of them and and without being able to read music all you can do is learn to by ear to play the tunes you already know and bam jazz yep because now we're on a trumpet playing this cool tune with these rhythms from over here and a little touch of ragtime and a little bit of so it's it's this uniquely american form of music that comes out so victor goes okay we should really record this now please 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 hear me when i say that new orleans jazz came solely out of the african and um mediterranean not <laughs> mediterranean <laughs> Caribbean um, populations there, Mm -hmm. the the Creole people. Um, And so their original plan was to to record um, a person who was out there doing it. Um, And his name is Freddie Keppard. And he should have been our very first jazz record recording artist but he wasn't Hmm. can you guess why he was afraid he was literally afraid that people were going to steal his stuff if they could listen to it on a record so he declined um and he was sort of the spiritual successor to a musical successor to Buddy Bolden, who's like the original cornetist. Mm -hmm. So he lives in that space between Buddy Bolden and Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong is a kid at the Waif's home when um, Keppard is out, like, touring the nation. I mean, this was a famous dude doing the vaudeville circuit. So um, they're up in New York, and he turns it down, and so they turn to this other band, which is the original Dixieland Jazz Band, And they say, hey, can we record you? And they're like, yeah. Well, great. Who cares? Well, it was a bunch of white guys. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they definitely helped popularize jazz in America. But we missed out on 
having a forever legacy of some of the original progenitors of the the of the moment because they were afraid of the technology. Right. They 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 were worried about somebody stealing and and yeah. and making it their own. Yep. And it wasn't just it was just just Keppard. Um as music began to be recorded, um legitimate air quotes, legitimate musicians and performers didn't want to be recorded because the sound quality wasn't fantastic. Right. You know, it no, it did not sound like you were sitting in the theater listening to an orchestra when you played it back on the record. <laughs> so a lot of people refused to be um to be recorded. And it was really uh the Tin Pan Alley, the the New York Broadway songs becoming, first of all, getting distributed in sheet music and then being recorded that really sort of um, set the stage for what we consider the modern recording industry. Right. right. So um, I think that that specific thing with who's going to be the first person to record jazz is deeply relevant to this AI discussion, because we can either embrace AI and say, great, another tool for my toolbox, how can I use it? Um, or we can have that fear reaction, that insecurity of like, oh my God, I'm not getting enough placements as it is. And it's just, given the, given the hindsight of uh, whatever that is, uh, a thousand years I can say with confidence that every time a new technology hits, it becomes incorporated into the life of that um, musical sphere, that that musical time period, and it actually makes us go further. Mm. It, it gives us more challenges and a higher bar to step up to. And so, yeah, I am sure that we may miss out on some gigs from some indie filmmakers who are doing a short and they just need, like, emotional pop. Okay, cool. But, you know, Spielberg is never going to log on to <laughs> auto AI music and get a film score out of it. It's not going to happen. Right. So um, that's yeah. my take on it. No, sorry I, I to think, talk so long. <laughs> no, I, again, this is literally what we talk about in our downtime. Uh, I think there are, there are a couple of couple of main threads. Uh, the first thread is seeing how this is nothing new, mm -hmm. to the point where that feeling of anxiety, that fear, I think is is normal, right? Yeah. It, it's normal to kind of oh my gosh, I see something that might displace me. Right. And so I think that's understood. And I mean, it's it's what one of the big reasons that, you know, ASCAP got boycotted in the 40s mm -hmm. and why BMI was uh, was really, really established because recordings, specifically radio royalties, mm -hmm. were getting totally hosed by ASCAP. They're like, that's not a live performance. It's recording, but we don't want it's, it's unless you're there in the in the room, we're not going to pay you nearly as much. And right. BMI uh, artists and the recording artists said Nope. And they started, they created this huge, huge uh, walkout uh, right. to the tune of like two and a half million songs. I think I, I read <laughs> it, was, it was insane over the, over so the. So more uh, than 10 is what you're telling me. Yes. More than 10. <laughs> I'm sorry. 1.25 million songs. One and a quarter million songs. There was no music uh, that got air on uh, NBC or CBS radio stations. Wow. Instead, they just use public domain and regional, uh, regional music, and and ASCAP lost their shirt. Mm -hmm. That was uh, in ten months in 1941, yep. and so they eventually buckled and said, "Okay, okay, all right, okay, okay." okay. Um, but I mean, that's one of the reasons was a company fearing that this thing is going to displace us. I mean, we haven't even mm -hmm. talked about like jukeboxes and right. how jukeboxes, you know, basically if you don't have bar bands anymore, you right. know, as, as far as, or, or a, a pianist in a bar right. because they got jukeboxes. Right. And so, so there's the fear, which is understandable. But the second part of that is seeing and using AI to your advantage. Right. And I think that's, that's where you have 
you have are, are using technology to your advantage. Mm-hmm. Enter like the crooners, right? right? The crooners, you have Bing Crosby. This is fascinating. Yeah, Bing Crosby. All all of all of this era of soft spoken kind of really close, blah, 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 right? That would not at all be possible without recording technology. Microphones made crooners happen. Right. I mean, when we're talking about this original Dixieland jazz band recording, the way they mix it is they literally put you either closer to the horn or farther back from it in (laughs) the room. And that's mixing. That's right. Yep. So everything, the reason we have um, in the early 20th century, uh, the big voices, and especially um, in the jazz realm with Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith and all those gals, just huge voices is because there was no amplification. Mm -mm. If they were going to play a room, you know, a theater, they had to reach the back rows. Um, So, and then as we got recording technology, that got a little bit better. And then the crooners came around after the ribbon microphone came around because suddenly you didn't have to um, physically move anything in the microphone to get it to record this thing over here. It's so much more sensitive. And so you could just kind of get up on the mic and have a nice sultry voice or whatever. Mm-hmm. Absolutely 100% technology based. Yeah. Bing Crosby is never, is, is never going to be able to sit on stage, uh, without a <laughs> microphone right. and belt over a band. Yeah, that's I, right. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm assuming, I'm sure somewhere in his career he was able to do that. But the being we know, yeah, is that soft spoken kind that's of. That's right. You know, and uh, and that's that's technology and mm-hmm. using technology and leveraging technology and not being in fear of it. So so let's let's go all the way to now. Okay. You know, computers are getting much more sophisticated, mm-hmm. and things are showing up even in our plugins. Like plugins mm, right. where uh, things are uh, – patterns, loops are dynamically generated. Mm-hmm. Uh, Logic's drummer track right. kind of comes to mind here. And this is coming yep. from a drummer. It's really sophisticated. It is. And Logic's drummer plugin can do a lot. It can yes. absolutely do a lot. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be as good as me, a drummer, programming my own drums. Right. Or – me a drummer, meticulously programming drummer say. to be able to do all the things that I know it should do. Right. And there's, you know, depending on the style that you're working in, um, um, there's there, there's idea of, of playing just a little bit behind the beat or just a little ahead of the beat. And I can't say no machine will ever do that. That's crazy because here we are. Um, but the the human ear is not so easily replaced. And so if I had all the snippets of every possible drum lick in the world, I'm still the master of finding them, putting them together, crafting and creating something unique and individual. And that also speaks to the idea of having very big ears, Mm. listening and listening and listening, not just to the stuff you like and not just to the stuff you're, you know, the genre that you're trying to write in. Everything, jazz and folk and classical and banjos and Mm. Bela Fleck and uh John Coltrane and um on and on and on because that's all bits like almost literally like computer mm. bits that get into your brain and suddenly something completely new and individual and unique comes out but you can't do that if you don't have the bits in there to start with right right uh you have to you have to feed you have to feed into yeah. it and so if you're dealing with a tool, like an AI tool, a dynamic, dynamically generated thing, it will be, it will yield much better results if you are able to feed into it. And and, and mm-hmm. looking back to the printing press, putting you know, putting music into the hands of you know the masses, uh, it's true that it is easier today for somebody brand new to open up an app, open up GarageBand or whatever. And make music that 20 or 30 years ago would have required a college degree. 
Yeah. Or just access to live or like orchestra. Or like Herbie Hancock level of genius. Right. Ex <laughs> exactly. Because if you wanted to make epic music, for example, you, you mm -hmm. could not, to get it, it, to where you're approaching any level of realism. Right. Right. You, you, the tools did not exist. So tools are making those things more accessible. Yes. But don't live in fear. I'm here to encourage you not to live in fear of that, but to embrace it. So whether it's a new plugin that has uh, a, a new uh, arpeggiator engine or whether it, it, it is a, a sound palette which has these dynamically generated, you know, uh, granular waveforms or whatever, whatever it is, I say embrace it. Mm -hmm. And use it, and and how I answered that poll that, that was over at fifty two Qs, and we'll, we'll you know we'll have a screenshot to that and everything. Yeah, how I answered the poll was it's just another tool because at the end of the day, like you said, Steven Spielberg's not going to dial up an AI generated <laughs> score, or even right. let's 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 dial it back just you know not to Oscar award winning directors <laughs> like Nike or right. even CBS Sports. You know, right. I write for CBS Sports, and they are not going to take an AI generated thing, not right. with so much money on the line, not with so right. many viewers, you know, 45 million people heard my, my cue on the AFC championship a couple of years ago. Yep. That, that they're not going to take a chance on no. AI on, on a dynamically generated. However, the stakes are me, way too high. <laughs> they're way too high. There is way too much skin in the game mm -hmm. to to allow that to kind of happen. Yeah. No more than they would accept a script from a, a dynamically generated uh you know algorithm which figured out you know plot lines a story. Right. I don't know if you've read some of those, but you can find like this is a, a a TV script written by AI, and some of it's kind of funny, some of it kind of works. But at the end of the day, there is the the uncanny valley, the yep. the disjointed. Like I can tell a human didn't have their hands on this, right? And so as soon as we are talking about something that is going to be experienced by humans, the human needs to keep their hand on the wheel. I'm looking mm -hmm. at you all, you Tesla owners. Mm -hmm. That's, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just too old for that, but this whole self-driving car thing, I get it. I get it. It's the future, right? It's, it's Jetsons, cool. we're almost there. But I I'm not going to sit there and like be on my phone with my car driving for me. Right. Uh, right. Because at some point, I am interacting with other human elements, and that brings variable. And so, anyway, I'm getting a little off topic. But my my greater point, is is that as a composer, as a producer yourself, do not fear these things. The robots aren't coming to take our jobs. They might be making our jobs easier and they might be democratizing our jobs. But I mean, I'm proof that before I had access to some of these tools like sample libraries and plugins, I wouldn't be able to do this. Right. And chances are you wouldn't be able to, too. We wouldn't even, this channel wouldn't exist. This podcast wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be able to talk about realistically having a sustainable career in production mm -hmm. music if most of these tools didn't exist. Because you had to have a studio. You had to, you know, record everything. You had to have access to all these people. There was a reason why, why library music used to be very, very expensive to produce. And the and 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 licensing from the libraries was relatively expensive, and it only really happened in studio towns, you know. Right. And so we're here today, as a result from these AI from mm -hmm. from, from the tools which help to democratize it. Absolutely. But it's it's the people who know what to do with the tools. Which there you go. it reminds me when I was a kid. I wanted to be one of two things. I either wanted to be an astronaut because, you know, what 10-year-old kid yeah, doesn't want kids. to be an astronaut, right? <laughs> um, but I really got into cartooning, and I mm -hmm. wanted to be an animator. And this was, you know, 1988, you know, 1990. And if you know anything about com computer animation and the animation industry, right around that time, 94, 95, 96, this is when Pixar started mm -hmm. winning Oscars. Uh, and uh, I honestly thought, well, I guess I, I guess I'm out of a gig. I, I'm not going to pers pursue cartooning and animation anymore because now you have to have a computer degree and it's all like you know computer, computer, computer. there's there's no need for artists anymore in that <laughs> industry, which sounds bonkers now. 
Yeah. Because admittedly, at the be- you know at the beginning of you know if you look at some of the uh, if you look at some of the early behind the scenes of like Toy Story one, they do they look and they act and they're, they're, the way they interface with the tools are very much more akin to computer programming yes. than pencil and paper drawing. Yes. But even still, that element of hand drawn humans with a, with with a tool doing their art was still there. Mm-hmm. But I foolishly thought at the time, well, I guess I'm out of a job. Yep. And, and I, I remember consciously moving away from that. Wow. Because I just thought, no, I, I'm not going to be a computer animator. I want to be an animator. You know what that brings to mind? I, I know we've got a wrap. We've got other things to get on to. That's, that's, that's my podcast. I can go as long <laughs> as I want. <laughs> well, um, no it reminds me of the... Um, you know, the railroad companies at the end of the 19th century. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, all these railroad companies existed to make railroads and to keep things going and to make money that way and all of that. Well, as we developed the automobiles, suddenly the railroad, yeah, it's still for freight and shipping and all of that. But the passenger side of rail really started to decline. And so the guys who survived that transition are not the guys who were in the railroad business. They were the guys who were in the transportation mm. business. And there's a very subtle difference there. If I'm if I'm a um, computer composer and not a musician, then there's there's going to be some conflict when a new technology arises because that's not what I do. However, if you see yourself as the overarching, the whatever this looks like moving forward, I'm mm. going to get on that train and be part of it, then you can you can um, incorporate all the new tech and it's awesome and it saves you time and gives you ideas and, and all of that kind of thing. Mm. So, you know, the thing is to not be in the railroad business, be in the transportation business. That's right. That's right. We are not in even though it's called 52 Qs, right? We are not necessarily in the Q business as much mm-hmm. as we are in making music that that editors, that producers, that directors can use that that convey an emotion mm-hmm. that they can use in their works, that they can use in their whether it's, you know, whether it's a, a, a toddlers and tiaras, you know, <laughs> or a cooking show or whatever. The idea is that we're providing you know, something that they can use to help tell their stories. Right. And at the end of the day, they don't care what tools we use. Right. At the end of the day, somebody doesn't care if uh, how I get from point A to point B, right? Whether it's a railroad or whether it's a car, you know? Yeah. It, it reminds me of like the photography industry, mm-hmm. how, you know, like Kodak, you know, are they in the picture business or are they in the film, like film camera Image business, business. Right. right exactly right. and so uh they should be in the, the picture business mm-hmm. and you know, this, which which sorry. is why uh which is why you know the photo mats that you see now in the um in the drugstores it's why they mm-hmm. started putting printers yeah exactly because you know, they realized that people aren't developing film anymore right but those are like kodak yep. kodak industry what were you this say? whole conversation is why blockbuster didn't make it because they were in the video cassette industry not the, the movies home at movie. home industry. That's right. That's right. And there's there's countless examples of this kind of thing. So um, along with you, just I, I just want to encourage everybody to to actually open up and dream a little bit about this. Like, ooh, are we going to need soundtracks for augmented reality? Ooh, that's fun. Mm-hmm. That's another niche to get into. You know, um, are we going to have soundtracks on our refrigerators with the smart system? Yeah, I don't know. But there's there's so much room to grow and so much room to explore. There's really nothing to be afraid of. No, there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of. So at the end of the day, lean into it. Embrace it. Be the person, like be the the artist at Pixar who 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 can bridge the gap between mm-hmm. that technology and the hand, the hand drawn, like, and the artistry that goes into it. Cause you know, if I would have stuck, stuck around with it, I could have, I could have uh, been in the industry and seen like writing tablets and how, how the tools, you know, m- bridge the gap, Right. the tools bridge the gap and ultimately 
lean, uh, lead into uh, uh, all kinds of new, sounds like uh, new frontiers, but like <laughs> new frontiers. I mean, we're talking about like hybrid orchestration and, mm-hmm. and the whole like Inception Brahms and all of that stuff and Mac Quail, Mr. Mm-hmm. Robot type sounds. A lot of that is due to techn- technological advance, uh, advances in music production. And even, um, you know, I do a lot of live theater. So on that side of things, um, the the what main stage has done for that industry is revolutionary. In yeah, main stage, in case you're not sure what it is, it's mm-hmm. it's actually like a, a live performance engine of logic sounds. So mm-hmm. people can program uh, like uh, it's scene one here is you playing piano, scene two now you're playing string, scene three, and so it's set and up for live performances. You can layer instruments uh, uh, across each other so that you know if you need in this section you need a violin in the right hand and a, a tuba in the left hand. Right, they can lay over each other. Yeah. Very very cool. Um, if you haven't ever used it, just go check it out. It's fun, but um, totally revolutionized. Like when I did when I music directed Rock of Ages down here in Orlando. There was a whole package of here's all the sounds, and they were identical to the sounds from the 80s records that that show was built on because we have the technology to go back and, okay, that sounds like this, and, and this is this. And um, and by the way, that's Kevin Rowland who did those. Uh, mm-hmm. Pretty much every main stage pack I've ever used has come from him. So we'll throw a link in there just to share the love a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so the alternative is is to either play the whole show on piano, uh, yes. or uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm or making hire, I'm feverishly writing down that name, or hire or musicians, hire or have like fifteen musicians, which nobody can afford, you know, or have thousands of dollars worth of different synthesizers and stuff, and exactly. nobody's going to do that, exactly. And so, so yeah, just embrace it, folks. Don't fear it. They're not going to take our jobs, and any any industry which would rather pay. AI was probably not going to pay you anyway. Okay, is that is that is that fair to say? Is that is that uh, unpopular opinion? They and if they if they were going to pay you, it wasn't going to be much because clearly they they don't value your work. And so I say, go do your thing. You be you, boo. You know, go <laughs> go do your thing with your AI generated music because you probably wasn't you 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 weren't my target demographic anyway. Right. That's right. Anyway, so Shannon, thank you so much. It's Thanks so for good having to have me. You. I, and, I uh, appreciate um, having the opportunity to share our nerdy chats with the world. <laughs> oh, I am absolutely positive it won't be the last. And uh, thank you for uh, for sparking the idea of sure. this AI discussion and for bringing an historical perspective to it because. Yes. You, you and I both know, you know, my undergraduate is music history. Your master's is in music history and musicology. Uh, we have to understand kind of where we came from. Mm-hmm. We have to understand uh, historical perspective to bring light to where we are now because we are not removed from any of that music history. It is a it is Absolutely. an ongoing a story. The tapis- That's right. The tapestry. We're just adding to the bottom That's right. of that tapestry. And so understanding history is the key to uh, to understanding where we're going. So, yeah. Yep. Very cool. Well, thank awesome. you once again. Thank you You're so welcome. much. So we're going to take a quick break. And uh, like, I, like I, I mentioned uh, in the intro, I thought it'd be a really good idea since we're talking about so much history, and since especially since uh, uh, Memphis played such a big role, uh, I thought it would be really good to listen to a blues cue, not blues clues, but a, a, a guitar-driven kind of muddy, swampy blues cue, uh, cue written by Doug Knight, and uh, it's called Miss My Mama Bl- Blues. So we're going to listen to that right on the other side of this quick break. Hey y'all, I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Cues podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Cues isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52Qs community is absolutely free. 
And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. That was Miss My Mama Blues by Doug Knight. Thank you so much for sending this along. This was sent along in our week 28 search, and uh, he said he is working on uh, finalizing a blues instrumental for a taxi listing uh, that was returned once because the drums sounded too virtual. So he's tweaked it and would appreciate feedback. And uh, the search is looking for instrumentals in the John Lee Hooker, B.B. Uh, King, Lightning Hopkins, Fabulous Thunderbirds, that kind of thing. They're looking for top-tier blues instrumentals that could work for film, TV, and other uh, placements, uh, melodies, engaging rhythm, musicianship, soulful energy. Well, I think you have absolutely nailed this brief, 100% nailed the brief. Uh, the mix sounds great. The guitar playing is stellar, and, and, and you do a, a fantastic job of building up the, the 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 blues energy as it as as the cue progresses. I mean, this is I really really not really a cue per se, but uh, as the song progresses, you're adding layers and pulling things back, and, and you're doing all of those things to keep blues instrumentals engaging, and they can be really really challenging, especially you know without lyrics. It can come off sounding pretty, pretty darn repetitive, especially since the chord progression is exactly the same the whole time. So you did a really good job with that. Listening back to your uh, to your drums, uh, I think I think we're doing really, really good here. As a drummer, I would play this drum part a little bit differently. And part of the reasons that I, I wanted to showcase this this cue this week was because of our topic. 
talking about music history and uh, and and the recording and you know, blues and, and uh, the history of, of of printed music and recorded. Anyway, you can't really talk much about music history without going through Memphis. And uh, you mentioned BB uh, King in your in your in the brief. And so I know that, uh, like I said, I just wanted to talk about blues. And uh, so I, I absolutely appreciate you sending this along. Having lived in Memphis for 11 years um, and played, you know, played my share of, of blues gigs, lots of blues gigs on Beale Street at BB King's, you know, a restaurant, um, I would do something like. I feel like the kick needs to be busier. And we'll, 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 we'll circle back to the harmonica part here in a minute. Coming here at the end, this, this, this uh, section through here sounds a little, in the drum part, it sounds a little repetitive. Blum. Blah, blah, blum, blum. Blah, blah, blum, blum. Bom, bom. Jum, 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 jum. Blah, 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 bom, bom. And then, so I think it, it just sounds like the same uh, pattern. Bom, bom, bom. It sounds just a little too repetitive. And one of the things that can be, that can really tip off whether or not drums sound really midi is uh, is in the cymbal work. And, and that ride cymbal sounds really like the same velocity over and over. And so I think that, I don't know if you need to go in and adjust those velocities a little bit so it's like, because if a drummer's playing these, they're going to be... Uh, Playing one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that quarter note, blah, tsa, boop, boop, tsa, boop, pa, tsa, boop, boop, tsa, boop, pa, tsa, boop. So it's that, that one, two, da, three, da, four, da, one, two, two, boom, boom, boom. It's that, that kind of feel to it, right? And so to have the ride symbol just kind of going, con, 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 is feeling a little inauthentic. Now, I want to also talk about uh, a little bit about your harmonica work here. Uh, and uh, because I also play blues harp and I've done like blues harp gigs in Memphis. And uh, and be before I played this, I was like, man, I, I hope well, I listened to the beginning of it. And I thought, man, this, I, this really needs some harmonica. And you did. And, and if we're if we're being authentic, you know, to to the style, I and mean, we're getting into kind of kind of a little bit of Chicago blues type, even though Chicago blues is a little bit more uh, a little bit more distorted with harmonica. And I've got my and, and we've got my little D harp here because we're in A blues. Um, some of I think I feel like there needs to be a little bit either more more tongue blocking or make sure that that's much more of a single note in the harmonica because I feel like we're getting a little bit too much. Uh, the, the the spacing in the harmonica playing is a little bit too wide. So it's more like, you know, so it's more like versus you want really more kind of single notes and save, uh, save the double and triple stops for really kind of emotionally impact impacting times. And that, uh, So I think if we really hung out on single notes, and, and here's here's the reason why, that style of that is is feels more folksy, it feels more like the folk arena versus the blues arena. So if we were to let me just see how it's been a while. And so, so if, if I was playing a line like that, you 
And so then I'm using, ooh, sorry, I got off, the, got off the wrong page there. So I'm using the double stop, opening up more than one single note to really add heft to the end of the phrase. That kind of sound, if that makes sense. Not that, not that I'm, I'm trying to give you a harmonica lesson. And I like the. That sounds nice. Hmm? But that 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 landing on that major third. That that feels a little too too majory. You know, you want you want that that flat third. Yeah, that. Was a... Yeah, nice. Yeah, it's just it's just that the the, the harmonica right now feels like I said it feels a little bit a little bit folksier in, in the Bob Dylan, Neil Young kind of school of harmonica playing and less in the uh, kind of blues blues harmonica uh, vein. But I'm just completely nitpicking here because the cue in and of itself is absolutely fantastic. This guitar playing, man. Man, we should, we should, we should collaborate, dude. <laughs> Let's collaborate. Is that... Is that wrong of me to uh, to ask? Uh, no, I, I would. Uh, yeah, I'd love to lay some harp down or do some drums or something. Yeah, this is really nice. Where this is taking me back. This is taking me back to uh, to my, uh, my 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 bar band days in Memphis. Nice. Lots of good spacing in the lines. Yes. Sorry, now I'm just listening and enjoying it. Dun, 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 jump. Blum, blum. And I would uh, I would slow that down just a little bit. Um, blum, bump, zoom, zoom. Ending on the major six. I don't know. That, that feels a little jazzy. Um, but man, uh, yeah, stellar, stellar, stellar work. And, and I wish you all, all the best. Like, like I said, the only thing that I think, um, feels a little MIDI is the ride symbol there at the end. Like I mentioned, this was sent along into our week 28, uh, 28 feedback thread. We put feedback threads up every single week. We are in the middle of uh, gathering for week 29. And uh, you can go in and you can post a thread. You could see here, what, 150, right? 150, uh, 150 comments. And so uh, we post we post threads every single week. Lots of action gets on there. So if you're looking for feedback for your threads or if or for your cues or if you want feedback or to leave feedback, please, please, why don't why don't you come and join us over at 52 Cues? Also, if you are looking for uh, feedback on your own cues and want to go just a little bit deeper, I offer interactive or uh, video feedback that uh, that you can um, you can order up if you'd like. Send me your cues, and I look at the mix, titles, your form, structure, all of that business. It is a service that I offer on top of coaching and everything else uh, that we do over at 52 Q. So we would love to have you there, uh, and even if you don't do any of those things, please know that I'm glad you're here. I am glad you're here. But once again, I do want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep all of these things going. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's going to do it for us today. Once again, another special thanks to Shannon for sitting in, and I promise you, you will hear from Shannon again next week. What we are talking about next week 
are the five ways, right now it's five, it might be more, it might be less, the five ways that you can get better as a composer. The five things that you can do right now to get better as a production music composer. So you definitely want to stick around for that. So once again, thank you so much for joining me. And I hope that you had a great, a great week 28. And I'm looking forward to hearing all about your week 29. Until next time, peace. The 52 Q's podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Q's community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Q's.com.